can now call Louise. Is it Count Vicky? Hi uh, everyone, my name is Louise Kulbitsky and I work for the Eradicating Ecocide campaign. I'm standing here to address the council, Oxford Council, so that they can support this, the law of ecocide, and trigger more political support on a UK and global level. Today in 2012, we are seeing mass damage and destruction to people and the planet on a scale that we've never seen before in history. We've learned that there are nine planetary boundaries which are vital to ensure that the Earth's system supports life, which if crossed will have devastating consequences for all life on Earth. We've already crossed three and we're rapidly moving towards crossing the others. We need to act before it's too late. The root cause of these problems is that at the moment the number one rule governing our world is that corporations can maximise, their, their number one priority is to maximise profit to their shareholders even if this means making profit out of mass damage and destruction to people and the planet. Our economy is destroying the very thing that we want to sustain, and that's life. To achieve true sustainable development, we need to create an international crime of ecocide, which puts a stop to this. Ecocide is defined as the extensive destruction, damage to, or loss of ecosystems of a given territory by human agency or other causes to such an extent that the peaceful enjoyment of the inhabitants of that territory have been severely diminished. So there are two types of ecocide. Firstly, man-made ecocide, which is often at the hands of a corporation, and then naturally occurring ecocide, such as climate change, anthropogenically caused climate change, which is essentially an act of God. Um, man-made ecocide, uh, as I said, it often occurs at the hands of a corporation. For example, the Athabasca tar sands, the Niger Delta, the logging of the Amazon. Um, we can't hold a company criminally liable, but we can hold those in a position of superior responsibility liable, those who actually make the decisions to carry out these destructive activities. Um, so naturally occurring ecocides are different. As I said, they include things like climate change. We can't hold a company liable for creating these kinds of things, but we can impose a legal duty of care on states to provide assistance to those facing these naturally occurring ecocides. And the two types of ecocide aren't completely separate. By putting a stop, full stop, to man-made ecocides, the kind of destruction that, that leads to um, naturally occurring ecocides, we have to actually stop things like, or we, we try to put a stop to runaway climate change. Um, the aim of this law is to put a stop to dangerous industrial activity. CEOs of companies are unlikely to continue business which is giving rise to ecocide as they could be held personally liable for this. Shareholders and banks won't invest in this kind of activity if they too could be criminally prosecuted. And investments and subsidies will be redirected into clean and green um, technologies and business. Um, if ecocide continues as well, it's not just about punishing those who commit it, it's about restoring the damage done, so restorative justice would be offered to offenders. Now, the ironic thing is that it's already an international crime to cause mass damage and destruction to the planet during wartime. It's just not a crime during peacetime. We already have a criminal court in place that could enforce this. And all we need to do to make this a reality is to make an amendment to the Rome Statute, which details the crimes, four crimes against peace. It only takes one party to the Rome Statute to call for an amendment, and it only takes 80 signatories to come on board and support this to get an amendment in place. Now, we're proposing that the law of ecocide comes into force in 2020. It allows an eight-year transition phase. Okay. One minute. All right, an eight-year transition phase to, to allow businesses to turn themselves around. This has happened time and time again throughout history, despite businesses claiming that there's going to be economic collapse. Businesses have turned themselves around very quickly. It happened in the abolition of slavery. It happened when CFCs were outlawed. Now, Oxford Council can play a significant role in making this happen. Oxford City stands out as a, a city that has put in place ideas which have global repercussions. If Oxford Council stands up and demonstrates bold, moral, courageous leadership on this, we can make this a reality. Now, this is our pathway to true sustainable development. And you can reach out to local MPs, the UK government, and ensure that the UK votes in favour of making ecocide an international crime. Thank you.
we move on to motion and three? The um, Councillor Morton. And now for something completely different. <laughs> okay. Um, I will stand up and I'll try and speak loudly. Um, I consider this to be a legacy issue. This is my last council and I would like to feel that I've achieved something of lasting significance here. And if I'm able to persuade the House or the, the room to support this motion, then I feel that my four years here will not have been wasted. In, um, I went, I, I'm from New Zealand, as some of you may know, um, and I was at Auckland University when um, the Rio Earth Summit um, in 1992 happened, and we had the co-convener of the Rio Earth Summit, a lawyer called Simon Reeves, come and speak at my university about the aspirations of that Earth Summit. And there were very high aspirations to try and stop the destruction of the environment generally. This is a global issue, and I know it's, 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 a, it's not a local community issue, but it does affect everything right from national right down to the local community issue. 20 years have passed and little has actually happened on the ground, despite a huge groundswell of public awareness and concern for the state of the planet. The legislation which is in place and the treaties and agreements have not been able to reverse the tide of global destruction. And I don't know where, what your position is individually on um, the state of the planet, but personally I spend quite a lot of time worrying about it and not knowing what to do. 20 years after hearing Simon Reeves talk about the Rio Earth Summit, I was at a, um, a conference and I heard a woman called Polly Higgins talking about this proposal. And it's the first time I've had any hope that we might be able to make a difference. What she spoke about was the fact that all the legislation that's in place um, is unable to stop big companies and corporations and individuals from destroying the, the environment because there is no criminal prosecution that can be brought against them. And until there's a criminal prosecution that can be brought, people will just pay the fine. We have a system of pollu polluter pays. Right? And polluter pays means if you can afford to, you'll pay it and you'll still take the money. How much time have I got? A minute? minute. Hell's teeth. Okay, so the main, what we've basically got to do is we have to support this motion, which will then kickstart the MPs, two MPs in Oxford, go to the House of Commons, try and persuade uh, MPs of the House of Commons to take it to the Rio Earth Summit, which will be in June, and then the Rio Earth Summit will hopefully, with a two-thirds majority, enforce this motion. It will be the, the, the fifth law um, to join crimes against peace with ecocide, with crimes of aggression, with war crimes, and with um, crimes against humanity. Um, it will then be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which was set up by the Treaty of Rome in 2002, and it will enable individuals, countries and other organisations to take criminal action against any corporations or individuals who have committed ecocide. So it will enable um, things like the, the BP oil spill to land someone in jail. At the moment you pay a fine and that's it, nothing changes. And until people say, I can't afford to do this, nothing will change. So please support it, I could talk about this for an hour, it needs an hour, but Uh, when I first looked at this motion, I thought, well, this is not really within our concern and remit. But the more I listened to what Matt was saying and then Louise was saying, I realised that this is something significant we can do. Unfortunately, we could be using the sort of credit that um, Oxford has internationally. This is a bit bad of us, but I think we should be using it as something that will make other people say, well, Oxford has done this and then it might spread across the country. I think this is the thing that we can do, and usefully do, towards the much bigger problem. And I think we should. I've been rather frustrated here in this council not being able to do much environmentally, and this is the one thing I think that would be easy, and we should go ahead and do it. Mark. Uh, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I feel slightly bad about opposing this motion, not only because I agree that those who who commit ecocides have a moral responsibility to pay for them, but also because I clearly know less about it than the people proposing it, both Matt and Ms Kowalki. Uh, however, I do have a great deal of scepticism about the ability of the international criminal justice system to do what this motion implies it will. 
The International Criminal Court has been up and running for about 10 years now. In that time, it has successfully secured one prosecution. That was last month, and that was of a Congolese warlord. So I think to imagine that the CEOs of, co of companies that can, for example, BP, or those involved with tar sands, are going to find themselves in front of the ICC is very naive. Um, I think the two, the two kind of assertions I would take issue with are, I don't think there's a recognition here of the difference between international and domestic law, and I think there's a misunderstanding of why regulatory attempts to protect the environment have failed. International law does not really work like domestic law. It's much harder to enforce. If it worked like domestic law, there'd be no Israeli settlements in the West Bank, there would be no North Korean nuclear weapons, and there'd be no Japanese fishing fleet. There are, and that happens because when international law only works when company, countries either decide to follow it, or a, or a country that is sufficiently strong makes them follow it. Um, now this is worth bearing in mind, because if you think about why a lot of the regulatory schemes to deal with climate change and other environmental problems haven't worked, uh, it's typically because the governments that should be enforcing them, should be pushing for them, haven't. For example, the European uh, Union's emissions trading scheme does not cover aviation. So what we frequently have is a system where actually the polluter doesn't pay. And now, if com countries are unwilling to see the companies based in them paying small amounts of tax or following reg or dealing with simple regulations, there is no way they are going to consent to, to, co to criminal prosecutions against those companies for breaches of environmental law. So, what I would say to this is, before we give up on regulation, let's first try it. Uh, Lord Mayor, I, I have great sympathy with, with Matt's motion. It does seem to me that uh, w whether there may be practical issues of the type that Matt has uh, mentioned, uh, Marx has mentioned, the, the reality is that unless there's some kind of national, international statement or commitment to this type of crime, then things are not going to move forward. The, the par partial and piecemeal approach of taking a regulatory approach nationally, <coughs> nationally will not work. So an international declaration of ecocide as a criminal, um, uh, as, a, as a crime, would then encourage uh, local regulatory action, national, national uh, legislatures to take the same action. So just as, for example, you could now sue a company about criminal negligence for for a business uh, uh, fault, like the railways, for example, if there's an uh, accident, this would then stimulate the same kind of reaction on part of, of national legislatures. So I think we should support it, not because I believe it's going to be a quick fix, nor that I think it's going to be followed immediately by everyone saying, because Ox has done it, we must follow it. It will nonetheless have a demonstration effect on the national governments across the world that will actually have to debate this issue and decide how they're going to deal with these fundamental crimes. And as Matt said, if you look around the world now, you look at the kind of issues which we've, we've faced in terms of the destruction of the rainforest, the uh, destruction of the uh, Arctic Circle by, by tar gas uh, uh, shale, shale mining. I mean, what we are looking at is something where the, the treasures of the earth are being despoiled. Unless we <coughs> now, we're going to face a very bleak future for our children and our children's children. So I think we should support this motion, and I hope we will actually then see some international action following through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got six more names and I propose to draw it to a close. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, I strongly support um, Council Morton's proposal. Uh, <clears throat> I do appreciate what Matt says about oh, the lack of effectiveness oh, oh, uh, of international regulation, but. <clears throat> What I, what I would like to see is us making a statement that people in developing countries should, <coughs> should approach the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, ac the environmental sustainability of their countries, the environmental sovereignty of their countries, as something they have as of right, and not something that they, where they have to beg, where they feel they have to beg the governments of the rich world 
for action was a right they had that the government of the rich world should be obliged to act on. I had the, um, I had the uh, honour of translating some correspondence about a year ago, actually, um, between our MP and a member of the Paraguayan Senate who was approaching him uh, asking um, asking for legislation in the British Parliament con to control the activities of British companies that are despoiling the natural environment in South America and in other places. And although it was, uh, although it was quite fun to translate, because rather in Congress, uh, Le de Ganaderia Sostenible Propuesto por mi compañero Rob Flello MP, it wasn't. <laughs> it was. Uh, it, it wasn't. It wasn't fun to read the correspondence because the <clears throat> clearly. They clearly people felt that they had to go cap in hand to, uh, to, to, to the governments of rich countries and the government of our country sadly did not see fit to pass that particular bill and, and, not, approach, and not approach it as if this is a sovereign right. It may not have much, if, it may not have much effect immediately on helping the people of developing countries to enforce their rights, but I believe it is another lever that they, they shall have, and it is something that can add to their dignity, and it is something we ought to be stating our support for. Lord Mayor, I shall be supporting the motion uh, but on two grounds. Firstly, I hope that Matt will accept it uh, as, a, as, a, as a gesture uh, that uh, expresses my uh, sadness that he's leaving us. I've admired him over the last two years and I've been very glad to work with him in, in East Oxford. Secondly, Lord Mayor, I believe that uh, this is the right thing to do, uh, despite all the caveats that uh, Mark has just uh, rightly draw our attention to. When I speak to schools about the European Union, I, I, I tell these young people that they have a wonderful challenge ahead of them. Theirs is the generation that is going to have to grapple with the emergence of global governance. Not global government, government, but global governance. We have a, we have a world which is increasingly interdependent, uh, in which one person's loss of rights and dignity is another person's loss of rights and dignity. And I fully support this motion. Thank you. Yeah. Oscar. Oscar. Thank you. Um, sorry, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I, I too will be supporting this, and I wanted to say um, two things to Matt, actually. Number one, I don't think your four years culminates in this moment. I think you've done lots of good things, and I hope that after you've stopped being a councillor, you will continue to send us your ideas, because it's deliberative and collaborative ideas that you've brought to the council since you were elected, and I've always been grateful for yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I know a lot about council minutes, I don't know much about international law, but what I do know is that <laughs> experts on international law estimate that probably about 90% of it isn't written down anywhere yet. There is probably about 90% more that's needed before we have a full body of statute law, um, which the International Criminal Court can carry out and which the United Nations can back up. That said, I think it is a good thing to add a new broad category of offences under a heading of ecocide. I think we'd probably all be clear that sticking ecocide in in this sort of way isn't to imply any sort of simplistic moral equivalence with the other four crimes against peace. This is too complicated for that. It's about something different, Lord Mayor. It's about putting a line in the sand and acknowledging that this is something internationally which we would like to take action and move against. To address Mock's point about the impracticality of, of, of pursuing these sorts of crimes in this sort of way, I think it's pretty clear actually that it's very difficult to do any sort of prosecution under international law through the ICC at the moment. You've only got to look at the Joseph Coney situation, which was prominent five or six weeks ago and prominent again this week. Um, he's been top of the ICC's most wanted list for a decade and the difficulty of prosecuting that situation shows that even the established bits of international law don't yet work terribly well. I think there is nothing wrong, frankly, with raising our eyes to the horizon and looking at what might be possible and what might be desirable in this case, than necessarily getting too bound up with the mundanities of what we can achieve today. So I shall be supporting. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, three, three things. First of all, uh, I echo what others have said. I, 
I think uh, Matt's been a lovely colleague to work with, actually. He's incredibly, incredibly sincere, incredibly civil. We've had some great conversations. Um, Matt's a brilliant listener as well as being uh, a, a, an eloquent speaker, uh, and I'll certainly, I'll certainly miss him. Um, no, it's a, it's a councillor, but I hope we may uh, stay, stay in touch. Um, on, on, the, on the motion, um, my concern with, I suppose, ecology is slightly different perhaps from where the Greens will come from, because I suppose for me it's found up the wider class analysis, and it's about how um, the poor will often suffer at the hands of the rich, how the powerless uh, will uh, face terrible developments at the hands of the powerful. And I think actually you often see that happening, not just in the economic sphere, but also in you know, like the environmental sphere. And you think about, for example, you know, a, a, a rich company trying to turn the centre of land mass of Cosmo into open cast mining or disposal or power station. Uh, or you think about the horrific impact of climate change upon very marginal communities uh, in the globe in, in places like Bangladesh. So I think that it, it is partly about a concern with inequality, which is where I'm coming from, rather than necessarily the natural environment per se. Uh, and there I do absolutely think, actually, that sending some sort of statement uh, that kind of a, a, a grab for others' resources uh, and the domination of the powerless by the powerful uh, in the ecological sphere is wrong, just as it may well be wrong uh, in, other spheres, in other spheres as well. So I think this is a good idea. I also think, to be honest, Mark's point about the uh, ICC is a bit harsh. Yes, we have international law. No, it hasn't led to uh, an outbreak of uh, global peace everywhere. But still, the, uh, the reasons for developing organisations like the UN um, and, and the ICC has been a response to uh, catastrophes experienced. Um, and I think this is an appropriate response to ecological catastrophes, which have been experienced in probably the worst forms which are impending. So I intend to support it. Scott. I was going to make a short speech in disagree with Mark's point, but I think it's been made very well by Councillor Jones and Councillor Van Loon, so I'll just say I'll support Thank you. Stuart, I'm sorry Stephen, but I did make a cut off. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, Lord Mayor, I have uh, a very personal reason for speaking on this issue, and that's because uh, uh, in the good old days when it was ruled by the Liberal Party, my native country uh, joined up to the ICC, unlike the United States, unlike China. Um, and uh, it is uh, making its contribution at present, even though it's now under a Tory government, to the work of the ICJ. Uh, IC, ICC, uh, in uh, bringing about a world in which it is becoming more and more difficult for people in power to uh, do their will with impunity uh, and immunity. Uh, I would not like to see uh, uh, my native province, uh, the northwest corner of which is uh, now being made uninhabitable by international uh, companies which are exploiting its oil sands, uh, uh, go without criticism, go without pressure uh, from the international community uh, uh, in the path that it's taking. And uh, I'm very proud to belong to the uh, cooperative movement in the United Kingdom, which has uh, made a policy to put pressure on the Alberta government to uh, treat the people who actually live in the northwest corner of Alberta. Uh, as um, people who deserve to have an environment in which they can drink the water without getting cancer. However, neither would I like to see uh, uh, my country withdraw from the ICC. And I know the Tory party that's running my country, they would do it at the top of a hat if they thought <coughs> that uh, people who were going about the business of developing that country in the way that the Tories would like to say develop we're going to be criminally prosecuted by an organisation that Canada subscribed to. Uh, I, I welcome the day when we do have uh, uh, international law uh, which prevents echo, echo side. Uh, at present, however, we do have an ICC which is struggling forward, doing wonderful work uh, on another front. I don't want to say that front undermined, I don't want to say it undermined by my country. Uh, personally, I'm going to cast a very personal vote against this motion. Okay, Matt, do you want to sum up? Yes. Okay. Um, 
It's funny because, uh, Mark, uh, when uh, I think it was Westminster was de debating the abolition of slavery, there was a lot of people, and I can't remember from whether it was Whigs or Tories, um, who put up various things saying, well, we could have a cap and trading system, we could reduce the number of slaves that were sent, we could maybe <laughs> work them less hard, um, we could bring in various regulations to you know, ensure that, they're, that, that less of them died in transit, that they were given more space, that all this sort of thing. And luckily, none of those proposals were carried forward. But that's exactly what we've been doing with the environment all along. We're basically saying, all we need to do is regulate better how we exploit our environment. And it hasn't worked at all. We're capping and trading is not going to work. You know, having tighter regulations and more use of uh, polluted plates is not going to work. That's just to sort of you know, that point there. Um, also, we need we need something to control the transnational companies where where you've got you know, British companies working in Canada who are who under whose jurisdiction, you know, who controls them. So we need some sort of transnational law. And I really regret what you brought up because it could well be an issue. But as far as I understand, um, Canada has already signed up to this. And as long as the law is actually held internationally, even if they pull out of it, they will still be under the jurisdiction of it. And so it will still be powerful. I mean, I'm not a legal expert. This is just what I've been reading up in my homework for this. Um, the other point <laughs> I'd like to mention is uh, to your thing about human justice and everything, that there is a peace cycle. And if you destroy a habitat, you create poverty. And if you create poverty, then you create um, competition for resources, and that will lead to conflict, which will lead to war, which tends to lead to even more damage to the environment, and you create this you know, this, yeah, vicious cycle. And if we stop that cycle, if we basically put it to bed, and we say, that's it, no more of that, it will make a huge difference. Um, is that my time up? That's it, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Very excited to see the question done. We have actually have 10 minutes left, so can we move to the vote, please? All those in favour? Don't forget to vote, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it's carried. Thank you. Um, if we can move to...